members and members of uh, our CMT uh, team and other officers and welcome also Will Dixon to our meeting. I'd also like to thank Colin Mann for, uh, for being in attendance as well. Thank you. Um, uh, I think it would be something that I should actually reference this evening is the fact that we're, we're obviously in a local lockdown. Uh, it's really important that I stress and, and emphasise to people that, you know, this is a stark reminder that COVID and the disease has not gone away. And I think it's really important that we remind our residents that, you know, we, we, we need to to the new uh, measures that have been put in place to help protect our people and our place. Um, I would like to reference the our council website, which has the full list of FAQs and the regulations. If people do have any queries, they can access that information. Thank you. OK, on to the agenda uh, to receive apologies if we had any. Christina. Yes, Leader, um, just an apology from Dave Street, Corporate Director for Social Services and Housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you can record that, Charlotte. Thank you. OK, uh, on to declaration of interest. Councillors and officers are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and or prejudicial interest in respect of any item of business on the agenda in accordance with the Local Government Act 2000, the Council's Constitution and the Code of Conduct for both councillors and officers. Is there anything to declare? Take silence, there's nothing to declare. OK, move in to approve and sign the following minutes um, from the Cabinet held on 22nd of July. If I can go through those. OK, for accuracy, page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five and page six. Um, is everyone happy with those? If the members of the cabinet can put their cameras on, please, that were present in those meetings so that I can have a show of hands, please, that they're happy with those. OK, is every, can everyone put their cameras on, please? I, is there a problem? I'm not sure what's happened to you. Uh, Who, who's who's not on? I can see everyone, I think, on my... OK, for some seat. reason. OK, I, this is not going to work because I can only just see you and Lisa on the screen. OK. Um, OK, well, I'm in favour. OK, thank Morgan. you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll second. OK, if I can just have an audio then, thank you. I'm in favour. Thank you. I'm in favour. OK, obviously um, we've got two new members of Cabinet so that the, the members that were present in those meetings have now confirmed that they're content with the content of those minutes. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> I don't know what the issue is here. I can't actually see many people on the screen. Um, OK, um, Cabinet then on the 30th of July. I'll go through those, as well, which is page seven of our report. Page eight. Page 9, page 10, page 11, and page 12. I'll move those, those as a true record. Thank you. I'd like to second. I'll second those. Thank you very much. OK, all those in favour accepting those? OK, thank you. Thank you. I second. Um, can yeah. I just take it that we have confirmation that everyone's hands up that were there? Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. OK. Le Leader, can I suggest uh, sometimes that the the audio doesn't sort of kick in until somebody's spoken. So, for example, Councillor Sean Morgan has spoken when his camera came on and that sort of prompts the, the picture to stay up. So um, maybe that will help. Thank you. OK, if I can ask everyone just to con quickly confirm that then so that then they will come up on the screen. Confirm. 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 Yeah, confirm. Thank you. They're all, all appearing now. Thank you for that, Christina. Is all a trick to this Teams. Absolutely. Great. Uh, amazing technology uh, when it works. OK, so if I can just, I haven't, I can't see uh, Councillor John Ridgewell and I can't see Councillor Nigel George. I have confirmed. 
Thank you. You've appeared now. And John? Yeah, sorry. I, I did say confirm. Mike was off. Apologies, leader. That's why that's why you didn't appear. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you ever so much. We've resolved the technical issue. Thank you, everyone. OK, moving to agenda item five, which is when we note, obviously, in terms of the forward work programme, um, we um, are aware that there could be a potential shift in some of some one of the reports. Uh, and I think that's the agile working one uh, because it's now going to go to PNR and absolutely it needs to get to us then at a delayed date, um, which is approximately the 14th, is it? around that time of October, which I think is absolutely fine. Uh, and just to ask, I know there was before whether or not we can extend the, the list of um, works uh, in the programme in terms of maybe a, a longer time span, if we can arrange that. We know and understand that will be absolutely fluid because of uh, our reaction to things that are happening. Um, Leader, if I could just respond to that and just yeah, absolutely confirm that the flexible working report now is scheduled for a P&R meeting, scrutiny meeting on the 29th of September, and then it make its way back into Cabinet as soon as we can there afterwards. In terms of the forward work programme, it is limited at this moment in time, and members will recall that we have a policy framework uh, meeting scheduled uh, for next Monday. And the outcome of that meeting, where you will uh, give me some uh, priorities, will help inform a forward work programme over the longer term. So it's very much uh, over to you before I can uh, extend that forward work programme. Thank you. Oh, that's absolutely fine. OK, and we'll work through that to ensure we've got that information. Thank you, Christina. OK, um, just then we can have a show of hands just to note that then, please, everyone on the screens. Thank you. Camera on, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you all. Yeah, that's accepted. OK, to uh, now receive and consider the following reports. Uh, and the first report is agenda item six, which is the UK reception scheme. Um, and over to Nigel. Thank you, Leader. The purpose of the report is to provide an update on the authorities' participation in the UK's vulnerable persons resettlement scheme and its contribution to alleviating the humanitarian crisis affecting millions of displaced within Syria, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon and Egypt. The report also provides an overview of the resettlement programme being, being reformed post-2020 and requests to steer from the corporate management team on the food parties, or sorry, Request to steer from the cabinet on the future participation success of resettlement programme, the UK resettlement scheme and or the UK asylum seekers dispersal scheme. In 2015, Caffili Borough Council became one of the first authorities in the UK to support the vulnerable persons resettlement scheme. During the past four years, the authority has successfully resettled seven families comprising of 35 refugees. The Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme was a five-year commitment and that is now entering its final stages. Refugees are supported for five years and resettlement takes the maximum time period of up to 10 years. The UK programme has announced plans to continue its support for the refugees under a new resettlement scheme. The new scheme plans to resettle in the region of 5,000 of the world's most vulnerable refugees in its first year. The report seeks clarification on the role of the authority in the future resettlement programme, as well as recognising alternative approaches, such as the asylum seekers dispersal scheme. Should the authority wish to continue to support the UK government's efforts in meeting their international obligations to provide in humanitarian protection to those most in need? The Cabinet are asked to consider the following three options. Option one, participation in the resettlement programme draws to a, to a conclusion at the end of this current scheme and continues to support families of up to a maximum period of 50 to five, 10 years. Option two, CBC participates in the se successful UKRS. There are challenges in terms of housing availability additional learning needs and general welfare provision set out in the report. Option three, in addition to or in place of the new UKRS, 
CCBC establishes a dialogue with the Wales Strategic Migration Partnership to success the ASDS. A future report will be required once the implications are becoming an asylum dispersal area were assessed. Uh, I'd like to move option two, which is the preferred option. Thank you. Thank you for that. OK, um, John. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, I really can't imagine the horrors that these people have experienced. And so um, I'm delighted to, to second this report. I think it's, it's critically important that we do this. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. OK, um, who's who's um, talking to the report? Uh, good morning, Leader. Um, Catherine Peters, Corporate Policy Manager with the Local Authority. And also we have um, Chris Hunt, who is the Regional Community Cohesion Coordinator for the West Grant area. Chris is, is hosted by Torvine. Um, Chris is the author of the report. However, I would like to apologise to the Cabinet because you will see at paragraph 1.2 um, that um, actually this report should have been for a decision for Cabinet, not a steer from corporate management team. So it's my, my error that that hasn't been corrected in this version of the report. And also the list of consultees um, should have been updated as well. However, the content of the report is um, as suitable for the Cabinet. Um, I'm not sure if Chris would, would like to, to add anything. Obviously, um, Cabinet members given an introduction to the report and uh, outlined the Office of Recommendation. We're in a slightly different situation now than where we were when the report was first drafted, obviously with the COVID situation and refugee arrivals. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Chris, please, if you could give an update on where we are with the transition from one scheme to the other. That's absolutely fine, Kath. OK, please come in, Chris, and oh, welcome. Thanks, Kath. Um, yeah, so the uh, the new scheme was due to commence at the point of uh, the, the commitment being reached, which was 20,000 uh, refugees under the old scheme, the BPRS. Um, that originally was to, to, to conclude back in, in April this year, but obviously given the, the circumstances that we're working towards, that has been paused. So the UK resettlement scheme right now is on hold. Um, but will be commencing shortly. No timescales have been given just yet. Um, as and when it does commence, um, there is uh, an approximate 300 refugees to the to the tally of to, to take the the UK up to its its goal of of 20,000. And at that point, um, the new scheme will come into effect. Um, at the moment, uh, there is, like I said, no no clear date as to when uh, refugee resettlement will continue. But the Home Office are continuing to to kind of approach local authorities for their ongoing commitment. Okay, for that, Chris, and that's really helpful. Okay, is there any questions in relation to the report? Yeah, thanks, Leader. I, I, just one question that, that comes to mind, uh, Chris. You might be able to help me with this. Um, I'm interested to know what sort of success rate we have with this scheme in terms of you know, sustainability and uh, the families still staying in the communities and how they integrate. Perhaps you could uh, expand on that a bit, please. Yeah, so um, as Kath said in this details in the report, we have uh, resettled seven families over the course of the last five years. Success is, is difficult to measure. Um, every family will have their own set of circumstances, um, but orientation has, has gone very well. Um, language barrier has been the biggest hurdle, of course, um, and it's the gateway to, to kind of wider resettlement. Um, to support families, we have commissioned a, uh, a, um, a service to give home tuition to all fa family members of above 19 years old, um, and that is uh, supporting their community classes as well. We've had families uh, enter the work uh, work program, and and some families have gone on to to study at university. We've got one case in uh, Kafili where mum and dad are both uh, uh, enrolled this September to uh, to be uh, to undergrads of, of nursing degrees. So um, on the whole, it's it's worked very well. I mean, like I said, orientation and and wider resettlement is is a very difficult thing to measure, and there's no one goal really. So it's making sure that the families feel um, as welcomed and as orientated as possible. And I think to a large degree, we've achieved this. Thanks, really encouraging. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Really helpful. Kath, did you want to come back in? Uh, I, I was just going to reference the uh, the mum and dad who've been enrolled in the nursing degree uh, for this September, which is absolutely fantastic news and um, something that possibly we should have celebrated a little more. But obviously, with things overtaken us, we haven't done. Um, as Chris said, yes, yeah, success is very difficult to measure, but we have got some really um, some really good news stories out of the settlement. 
Well, maybe we could acknowledge that somewhere in, in the point in the future then, because I think that's an amazing achievement. So that's fantastic. So if we could do something, that'd be great, Kath and Chris. You know, I think we really do need to make a point of that um, because that's that's very good. OK, thank you. There any more questions? OK, if there are no more questions, I just want to thank both officers for um, bringing the report here today. And thank you for mentioning the amendments to that, et cetera, Kath. Um, if we're all happy then to go with a recommendation of option two, um, can we please, I'll do the roll call and go through then and take your vote in relation to that then. OK, Councillor Cuss. Four. Councillor George. Four. Councillor Gordon. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Thank you. Councillor Phipps. Four. Councillor Ridgewell. Four. Councillor Four. And Councillor Whiting. Four. Thank you all. That's moved and that's unanimous. Thank you both for bringing the report here today and uh, good luck with the rest of this. And, and obviously we'll look forward to the reports coming f forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, next item on the agenda is the COVID-19 business rental holiday uh, for Tredrummond campus. OK, if I can bring in Sean, please. Um, yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Lida. Um, this report is it details a proposal to grant a three month rental holiday to some businesses on our Tredrummond campus. Because we charge um, an inclusive rent, which covers maintenance and, and, and other things. Most importantly, it also covers the, the rateable value of the properties. So many of the, the businesses on our Tredolman campus were unable to apply for the COVID related grants, um, which were administered through the rate scheme because they weren't paying the rates we were. Um, they, therefore, so these businesses being ineligible for the grants, <clears throat> um, we've, we've since worked with many of the businesses there to see if they could secure other grant funding to help them through the difficult COVID uh, period. And in many cases, uh, these businesses did qualify for other grants, therefore they are not see see seeking help. But there are, however, a few businesses that have been unable to secure any funding. So this report is asking that we support those businesses who through no fault of their own were unable to uh, get any sort of grant funding and that we should give them a rent free period of um, three, three months to enable them to survive this difficult period. So I move the report and the recommendations contained within. Thank you, Sean. OK, Leonard. Yes, thank you, Lida. I'm more than happy to second the recommendations in this report. The wavering of the rents for these tenants um, that didn't meet the criteria um, for other grants, it, you know, it's absolutely the right thing that we do. They, as I said, they, they did not meet the criteria for the non-domestic uh, rates business grant scheme. Uh, and I'm sure that this will be a welcome help um, that they are desperately in need in in the climate that we find ourselves in at the current time. So I second the uh, recommendations. Thank you both. OK, um, could, um, is who's going to speak to this report? Have we got an officer that wants to come in on the report? Uh, Paul Hudson, I think. Paul Hud yeah, OK. Or Stephen Harris. <laughs> I sorry, I, I I can go, Steve, if you're okay. Yeah, um, I think as as Councillor Stennis sort of said there, you know, the the criteria that was set for this wasn't determined by the council. It was a quirk of the sort of arrangement that um, you had to be the sort of the nominated rate payer to apply for the actual ratings grant, and that was where this sort of disparity has come from businesses that if they were in a different environment, they would have been eligible for the uh, for the grant. So I think it's just sort of rectifying that uh, that anomaly basically to uh, to make make that right really. Um, the uh, the business you know in in terms of the actual business themselves they're um, um, like a lot of businesses they've suffered a downturn they have sort of fixed costs rent is, is one of those and I think this just sort of recognises that where if you're in receipt of the actual ratings grant you would have been able to sort of maintain your your fixed cost payments in a number of areas uh, to help sort of sustain and, and keep yourself going through this sort of crisis as we emerge on the other side. Thank you, Paul. Steve, did you want to make any further comment? Yes, yeah, Steve Harris, acting section 151 officer. 
just wanted to point out that in addition to the proposals in this report, um, Cabinet will be aware that we did offer assistance as well to businesses across the portfolio in terms of rent deferrals. And we did have a relatively good take up of that. Um, so we did waive rent or, uh, for a number of months and obviously agree repayments then to claw that back. So I, I, I just think it's important that we acknowledge that as well. Thank you, Lita. No, that's really good to point that out. Thank you, Steve. Um, Sean. Yes, thank, thank you, Lita. Um, I, I'd like to ask Paul. Um, I know that this council did a massive piece of work um, and got a huge amount of money out of the door um, operating the, the, these grants, um, the, the rates grants. Um, but the, these other businesses in, in our predominant campus, as you say, weren't eligible for that. Did we see or have we seen or are there any signs? I don't want to talk about specific businesses, but are there any signs that there are businesses that are going to fail because of the sort of uh, gap in time where, where they, they, there's been this uncertainty of funding? Of course, now we're offering them a bit of surety. Yeah, I think what, what we're seeing is, is a couple of the businesses in, in the campus are sort of downsizing, particularly those that have um, had staff working from home. A lot of them realise that they, uh, they they you know they don't need the the size of premise that they currently have. So what we're finding is some tenants are coming back and releasing the um the sort of the amount of tenant or asking to be released from the sort of the agreements so we can actually sort of market those units to uh, to other interested groups of which you know, we we are getting some interest as well. Um, it's it's not all a negative picture. Some businesses that are currently there are downsizing. But it does seem to be a, um, a sort of a demand out there as well from some businesses to start looking at uh, new ventures. So we are getting quite a lot of people looking to us for startup grants as well. Uh, uh, that, that I mean, we're talking generally about office buildings here and, and there is a general downturn in, in the need for offices, as, as everybody is quite aware. Um, just out of curiosity, are the business, the industrial units, are they, the, the occupancy is continuing there? Uh, yeah, I know it's, it's probably quite early in terms of the pandemic, but the first sort of quarter, um, sort of June, well, a April, April to June of this year, the actual occupancy across the portfolio was higher than January to March at the beginning of the year. Um, I know that sort of doesn't perhaps reflect on 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 the the longer term impact of COVID, but they sort of seem to be quite buoyant at the moment. Okay. But I think uh, we, we you know we we're waiting to see the impact of um, the furlough yeah. scheme, particularly, and what that actually does to those sort of job that uh, potentially um, might not exist yeah which is the end of this month okay thanks paul okay thanks both yeah paul that's a really important point there um okay uh ross did you want to come in yes uh, thank you leader uh, more of a comment than a question i just wanted to say you know how glad i was to see this report is on the agenda today and there are so many businesses that have struggled through what's happened over the past few months and what's happening now and i think um, you know, having this support and this rent holiday is, is a huge um, help, will be a huge help to them. And um, I'm very happy to support it. Thank you, Ross. OK, thank you for that. Absolute, I think is the absolute right thing to do for those that don't fall under those criteria that, you know, would have been covered off by other grant support. So I think it's vital that we signal that we want to see uh, these businesses survive. So, um, OK, I think we'll go to the vote then on this. OK, I'll do the roll call as per. OK, uh, Councillor Carl Cuss. Four. Councillor George. Four. Councillor Gordon. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Phipps. Four. Councillor Ridgewell. Four. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Stenner. Four. And Councillor White in. Four. Thank you, Warren. That's all moved and that's unanimous. Thank you all. OK, the next item on the agenda is item number eight, and it's the Cardiff Capital Region Housing Investment Fund and the Viability Gap Fund sites. OK, if I can ask um, Sean to come in on this, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lida. Um, this report is to update Cabinet on the Cardiff City Region 
housing investment fund and specifically for us here in Caerphilly outlines opportunities we have to unlock three brownfield sites at uh, Windsor Colliery in Abertridu, Getley Dig Heights in Massicoma and Healdy Grove in, in Bargard. The report outlines how the Cardiff City Region Housing Investment Fund can increase the affordability of high quality affordable housing, the availability, sorry, of high quality affordable housing on sites previously thought uh, d d due to the condition uh, of the land to be uh, uneconomic to develop. So this re represents um, a real opportunity for us to improve the housing prospects for, for residents within the borough. Therefore, I'm very happy to move uh, the report and the re recommendations contained at 3.1, 3.2 and 3.3. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Sean. OK, um, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you, Leader. I am more than happy to second this report. Um, as if the bids are successful, uh, this could mean increasing the provision of new affordable homes um, in our borough for our residents. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see this, the fruition of this and all the hard work that the Cardiff Capital Region has done in bringing these funds or well, the availability of these funds forward. I think it's an absolutely fantastic initiative and we you know I'm just glad to see that we've actually come to this point where we're in a position where we're making a decision as a cabinet um, to go forward with this so I think it signals the right move so thank you for that who's who officer is going to speak to the report Sean um oh yeah so sorry uh leader yeah I think we got um uh Rhea and Kate to speak to the report um I was just going to ask if I could ask a question later on on behalf of one of the ward councillors yeah, absolutely, Sean, no problem. And then you can come in. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Leader. Good morning, Cabinet. Uh, my name is Rian Kite. I'm the Head of Regeneration and Planning. Um, thank you very much for considering this, this report. Um, just by way of background, um, officers of the Council and myself included have worked tirelessly behind the scenes for many years with Cardiff Capital Region to bring forward this fund. And um, I personally am very, very pleased to see that um, we're moving forward now. Uh, we have for many years, as you were aware, in Caerphilly County Borough, been lobbying uh, Welsh Government for funding to unlock stall sites and brownfield sites in particular, uh, because as we all all know, we have a number of brownfield sites that we would really like to bring forward in advance of releasing greenfield sites. So this is part of the tools now available to us to make that happen. I think what I just wanted to do was just give you a quick fa few facts and figures about what the, the Housing Investment Fund is, uh, and then I'll go on to explain why we've chosen the three sites that we've chosen. And if I may, I need to draw your attention to a few updates in the report, if that's OK. So the objectives of the fund, really, as I suggested, was to unlock stall sites uh, that are unviable for housing delivery. Uh, it's to invest in projects that will deliver housing in areas in most need, whilst demonstrating value for money and delivery. Importantly, and even more important in the uh, post-COVID uh, environment, uh, this fund will help kickstart construction, generate jobs and deliver sustainable development and enhance the long-term growth and competitiveness of the region. The fund is open for local authorities, importantly, uh, to support key strategic housing projects in their area. So developers uh, are required to work with the local authority to bring forward sites. Um, and then obviously the local communities will benefit by way of um, the removal of derelict land from within their areas. Um, the fund is a, an opportunity for local authorities uh, um, to bring forward sites that need particular support, um, particularly site-specific infrastructure, site clearance and groundworks and land remediation. Uh, and all schemes obviously have to be state aid compliant. So basically the pot is um, a reward of up to £8 million per scheme. It will be a competitive uh, basis uh, in terms of the CCR uh, decision making. Uh, but each authority is allowed to uh, submit for consideration up to three submissions per local authority. Hence the fact there's three schemes uh, suggested to you in this report. Um, to be eligible, um, there has to be a viability gap. So if a, if a site can stand on its own two feet and is viable to develop without funding, it wouldn't be eligible for this for this support. Um, it has to be capable of delivering a minimum of 40 new homes. Um, ideally, a site should be an adopted site in the local development plan or in the absence of that, it should be a site which has got or is on the way to getting planning permission. Um, 
and all due diligence and checks will need to be made clearly. Um, we will have to draw down all the funding by March 2024. Um, the report uh, does indicate um, at paragraph 5.10 that further guidance is awaited. We've now received that guidance, so we've now actually got the plan, the, appli the application forms for, for the HIF, um, and that outlines what the, the deadlines for the fund are. Um, so basically, submissions now have got to be made to CCR by December 2020. Scheme evaluation will take place in January and February of 2021. We would hopefully get any funding award by March 2021. Um, and then obviously um, the post award would happen April to September, probably next year. So hopefully we'll be on site uh, by the end of 21, 20, uh, beginning of 22. Um, Paragraph 9.4 of the report, I'd just like to draw Cabinet's attention to the fact that we reference a potential clawback for Windsor Colliery site in particular of uh, 300k to Welsh Government because that received uh, a reclamation grant in the past. Having met with uh, Welsh Government as recent as last week, that clawback figure is actually £409,000, not £300,000 now. Um, but Welsh Government are amenable to waiver in that £409,000 subject to the scheme that's being delivered, meeting their exacting standards, particularly zero carbon housing um, and space standards that are uh, acceptable to them. So the three schemes, as outlined in the report, um, Windsor Colliery, uh, Getley Dig Heights <coughs> and um, Healthy Grove in Bar Guide, the two sites uh, will be delivered in partnership with our RSL partners. That would be Windsor Colliery and Getley Dig Heights. And then the third site is a potential Capilly home site, which obviously Sean Cousin and Jane Roberts Waite and Mark Noakes are working on on behalf of the authority um, to try and take that forward as a Capilly housing site moving forward. Um, and collectively, those sites are capable of, of creating in the in the region of three to four hundred uh, new homes, uh, some of which will be affordable. Each site will have a different level of affordable housing, depending on the housing need in that area and depending on the demand and obviously our waiting lists, etc. So um, I, I just um, would welcome your opportunity to take any questions. But I really, really am excited by this project and I think it's a great opportunity for us to submit three schemes to Cardiff Capital Region. Thank you ever so much, Vivian. And it's it's really useful for you to gone gone through that report and highlighting the absolutely outstanding work that's that is in this report and where we are to date. I think it's you know commendable that we're in this position um to be to considering this today. Um so thank you for that. Um I noticed Sean, your hand is up. Do you have a is it what you wanted to bring in? Um or was it uh, another question? It's a separate question, actually. Um just on what Rian said there about the waiving, uh, the Welsh Government considering waiving that £400,000 clawback, um, the, which relates to the remediation of the site many, many years ago. Yeah. Um, the, the, they, they must be pushing for some pretty stringent exacting standards when it comes to zero carbon or the type of house build. So I just wonder if you could ex expand on, the, you know, what Welsh Government are, are looking for, because it's really interesting to find out what their ambitions for a sort of carbon neutral society is going forward and, and how this relates to it. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously the dialogue in terms of the exact uh, type of housing that will go on Windsor Colliery is ongoing at the moment. Um, so United Welsh are working very closely with us um, and our colleagues in housing and in um, in planning in terms of what that looks like and what model we could potentially be using on site. But clearly there is a drive towards zero carbon um, because obviously there's a, a desire by all to have housing that's fit for the future. And obviously it is it's sustainable moving forward and cheap to run, uh, particularly in terms of things like fuel poverty moving forward. So, I mean, in terms of what, what exactly those houses will look like now, um, that's still being worked up, to be honest. So I couldn't I couldn't tell you what type of housing on this particular site will be used because we're still in negotiation on that. Um, but um, I'm, I'm more than happy to circle it some information about the general <coughs> principles of zero carbon, if you'd find that useful. Yeah, yeah, de de definitely. As I say, it would be interesting to know what exactly what kind of housing Welsh Government uh, are sort of driving towards. 
Uh, is this, I, I'm trying to think of the name of the, it's house as spelt in the German way, house. Passive the, house. Passive, passive house. house, that's the word I was looking for. Thanks, Rian. And, and that's the kind of thing that they are looking for you, is it? Yeah, um, obviously we'd, we've got our first uh, really large passive house scheme being developed in Caffili at the moment at the Magistrates Court. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. I know they've had challenges because of our climate down at that at that site in terms of um, meeting the exact standards for passive house. Uh, and I know the Sean Cousins um, and Sean might want to come in. I don't know, but Sean Cousins and his colleagues in housing are doing an awful lot of work uh, through Caffili Homes on new models of housing and, and obviously uh, passive house and modular a part of that dialogue moving forward. Um, but obviously there is a drive from Welsh Government now to get the mainstream home builders into this space. And definitely um, any grant and funding that they, they contribute towards projects in the future will require us to move towards zero carbon housing in whatever format that takes. OK, thank, thanks, Rian. Yeah, no, really helpful. Again, you know, it, you know, in terms of that zero carbon, it, it's obviously the way forward, isn't it, in terms of house building more generally. And I think with modern methods of construction, we're going to see a shift, I think. In that, you know, in that things can be well insulated, they can be cheap to run, as you say. And they, these are all the key factors, aren't they, that, you know, that people are very much aware of now and actually want to live in homes like that. So um, whatever we can do, you know, to to help understand what we need. But I absolutely think it's important that we understand where Welsh Government are in terms of that. And if we can have some information, then it will assist us, won't it, in our decision making. So thanks, Rian. OK, got a few indications. Leonard, then John. Yeah, I just wanted to, to make a comment um, that this funding is very, very welcome. Uh, this is an excellent report. We all know how expensive uh, brownfield sites are um, to make sure that they're safe to, to put housing. And um, without this funding, it probably they would not be viable and they are much needed homes and they will be excellent um, homes as well. So I'm very, very happy with this report. Thanks, Leonard. Absolutely. It's key to unlocking these sites that otherwise would just be left, you know, abandoned. OK, thank you, John. Yeah, thanks, Leader. Um, hi, Rianne. Haven't seen you for such a long time. Looking younger every time I see you. Um, question I've got really is regard to the delivery and, and the benefits to the local economy that there's this SME grant from Welsh Government. Um, and um, I'm just wondering how that's actually managed uh, in, in the long term. Is it managed by the local authority in terms of delivery or is it given to the developers to give to the uh, um, the, the contractors? Perhaps you can sort of clear the air on that and help me understand. Yeah, the, the, the SME uh, part of the grant, we haven't had the terms and conditions and the, the guidance on yet, but our understanding will be that um, it, it will be funded partly through local authorities, but with um, the Development Bank for Wales potentially taking the lead. So the SMEs would uh, would apply uh, with local authority support, we, we suspect, for funding from the Development Bank for Wales, potentially. Uh, but as I say, as yet, we haven't had the details on that element of this, this fund. So at, at the moment, it's only the viability gap funding that we've had the, the guidance for. Yeah, OK, thanks. Do we know, do we know when that might be coming out, that, 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 uh, that guidance or not? Well, to be honest, I think everything's stalled because of the COVID uh, yeah. situation. So we're about six months behind with this fund. Um, so I'm suspecting that's fallen behind it slightly as well. But when we've got any information on that, we will bring it forward to a cabinet's consideration. Yeah, thank yeah, you. And, and yeah, and further to that, John, yes, obviously the CCR is meeting, Cardiff Capital Region is meeting next week, and we, we've been already talking about how we look at this SME fund. So I, I'm there, obviously, as representative of the authority. So obviously they'll be working their way through that now. So that is high on their agenda because we've already had briefings around that 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 element and how we progress that and make sure that we you know keep money within our authorities we you know the, the fact that we do the right thing SMEs is really really important in terms of encouraging them so we're working through the details on that you know and as Rian said that will come in subsequent reports yeah so thank, thank you. you I mean I think I think my worry was that this money might be sort of um subsumed into bigger budgets for the big developers and our local companies might not might not get the opportunity to to bid into it that was all Absolutely. And that and that will be taken on board and I will feed that into in, yeah. into the, the CCR cabinet as well. 
Okay, thank, thank you, John. You. Yeah. Sean. Uh, yeah, thanks. If there's no further questions from, from the, I, I'd like to pose a question um, asked by w one of the local members, if I could, if I could pose a question to uh, Rian. Um, I'll be asking this question on behalf of Councillor Vince, Vincent James from Massicoma, and the question is, since the publishing of this report, I've made local residents aware that the plans for the housing development in Massicoma have re-emerged. Many people have expressed to me their considerable concern on the proposals, particularly with regard to its impact on the environment, additional pressures on road infrastructure, pressures on school places and accessibility to local GP services. If this funding bid is successful, how will the plans develop to ensure that they do not have an adverse impact on the lives of people already resident in, in Massicoma. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Morgan. As you're aware, um, this site, um, the Getley Dig site, apologies, the Getley Dig site is a site that um, has been in our local development plan in part for many, many years. So um, in part, the site is allocated in the adopted local development plan for or housing and therefore the principle of development was established by this council in 2010. Um, it was established as, as a consequence of um, uh, a planning appeal uh, where a planning application was submitted uh, and uh, uh, the application was determined by the planning inspectorate um, and obviously the site won on appeal. Um, I have got a map I could share which might overcomplicate matters but I'll, I'll try and share a map with you just to show um, the concerns if I can. Um, but basically there's a few uh, different areas to this site. There's the site that's got planning consent. There's the site that's got um, an allocation in the local development plan. And then there's the site that we're actually talking about in terms of um, this, this proposal for the HIF. So um, I'm just going to share my screen if I can, if the technology allows. Rianne, yes. oh, I can say you're short sharing all your emails then. Oh, sorry, don't look at my emails. <laughs> <laughs> the text was really small, so we couldn't see anything. Yeah, no, it's OK. I, there's, there's nothing dodgy there. You're OK. Um, OK, so this is the site that we're talking about. Um, this is the, the, the land at Getley Dig Heights. OK, so the land that uh, you were looking at that is sort of a darky green colour, uh, that essentially is the land that is allocated in the adopted LDP. So the principle of development on that land has been considered through the local development plan and is it's a, an acceptable site. Um, the site then is uh, edged pink. Uh, that site uh, has got planning consent. And if you could take a look at um, the access arrangements there, you'll see that that planning application was given consent on the condition there was given a new access that cut through the green wedge um, off the main road along the A472 there. So um, the, the pink area has already got the benefit of a, a consent that could be implemented. Um, the site that we're talking about for the Housing Investment Fund is the site edged blue. Uh, OK, so that's the that, that would be the extent of the developable area. And as you will see, there's a very small area there that cuts into the green wedge. The proposal at the present is not to implement the new access as shown on this um, pink area here, but to actually use the existing access of the junction at Getley Dig Heights to go onto the A472. We're currently in dialogue with um, the uh, developers on that, uh, and basically we'll, um, sorry, I'm just gonna go back to my teams if I may. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen now, just for you to get the context, thank you. Um, that was quite good, wasn't it? I haven't done that before. Um, but basically the, the proposal is, for at the moment, to combine all of that area that is, is subject to all these various planning consents and to do a comprehensive master plan that can meet current day standards in terms of uh, zero carbon, space standards, uh, environmental concerns, and all, uh, importantly, the new SAB requirements in terms of drainage. So all of those considerations will be uh, taken in the usual way through the planning committee um, when a planning application is submitted. Um, obviously, the planning application itself will be subject to full public consultation. 
um, all local residents will be uh, able to uh, put in any concerns they have in the usual way, which will be taken into account as part of the planning considerations on the planning application, uh, which would I, I would expect end up being a planning committee decision uh, by virtue of the scale of the site. Um, and therefore, any concerns that, that residents have will be addressed in the usual way through the planning committee consideration of the report. Um, and clearly there are many concerns here. Um, there are environmental considerations there uh, because there, there, there's um, contaminated land on the site which needs to be remediated. There are uh, a, a belt of trees on the site uh, that act as a wedge between the current site and the main, the main road. Um, and obviously there's an historic issue here around traffic uh, because of the A472 and the, the issues around Mysacama that we're all acutely aware of and there will be a need for a robust traffic assessment to be undertaken and indeed um, in, the, in the early considerations of this um, the, the RSL has undertaken a detailed traffic assessment which we are currently considering um, through, through early discussions because obviously we've got to do a lot of upfront work to ensure that this scheme is fit to meet the deadline for submission for the HIF so um, all of those concerns will be considered and robustly through the planning committee, uh, through the usual planning considerations uh, and other concerns um, along the lines of things like um, catchment areas, schools, places, GP surgery places, which normally raise their head in, in these sorts of developments. All of that will be reflected in the planning committee report in due course. Thank you ever so much for that detailed answer to that, because I think that helps, you know, and make it puts us all in the picture and other members in terms of understanding the process that we need to go through. So I think that's really a, a useful explanation there. I'll take Sean and then John. Yeah, thanks, Lida. It's just to make that comment that, you know, I mean, this the, the, this report, we were speaking with my future generations champion hat on, you know, we must be developing these brownfield sites. We cannot constantly build on green land. We can't allow developers to go out there and uh, just just develop green sites while leaving uh, brownfield sites behind undeveloped. We 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 got to contain and somehow control the um, expansion of, of housing and try try a and uh, be reasonable about the way that, that we, we deal with greenfield sites. And I just, I'm just, uh, I just believe so much in this report and I'm so glad that the Cardiff City deal and the Welsh Government are recognising the issues with brownfield sites and that uh, we are taking this, to, we're grabbing the bull by the horns, uh, so to speak. So thanks very much and thank you for the replay, uh, Ian. Thanks, Sean. John. Yeah, uh, thanks, Leader. Um, I certainly in, in endorse Sean's comments on, on this. Um, I'm just interested in the green wedge because I, I, I mean, clearly that 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 is slightly different. And I just wanted some sort of confirmation that we're going to retain as much of that as we can, and particularly that 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 very important tree cover. This the scheme that's before us at a very early stage in design and layout um, retains more of the green wedge than um, the scheme that they've currently got planning consent for. Uh, so it's a betterment, in fact, to what they've currently cons got consent for. We are mindful that there is a thin sliver of the green wedge that potentially uh, would be lost to development. Um, but that's got to be balanced up, obviously, by the planning committee against the consideration for the need for the houses, the remediation of the site and the need for the affordable homes. Um, moving forward, of course, when the local development plan expires in 2021, um, all our green wedges will cease to exist. So, um, it, it, you know, in terms of where the green wedges will be moving forward, obviously that will all be determined by the future development of the new LDP. Um, but as it currently stands, there will be a small slither lost if, we, if this scheme is approved. Uh, but as I say, it will be a betterment to the scheme that's got planning consent. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you ever so much. Um, OK, all right. Um, I think You've, we've, we've covered that report off. Um, I think we'll go to the vote now if there's no further questions or, or statements that want to be made. OK, um, if we can go to Councillor Cuss. Four. Councillor George. Four. Councillor Gordon. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Phipps. Four. Councillor Ridgewell. Four. 
Councillor Stenner? Four. And Councillor Whiting? Four. Thank you. That's moved. That's unanimous. Thank you ever so much, um, Rian, for your input today. Most appreciated. Thank you. Lee did if I may. Apologies for sharing my emails, but uh, I had to get you. to the map when it was in my emails. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Don't worry. That's OK. It was tiny. We couldn't see it. That's fine. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Bye. OK, the next item then is the private sector housing proposed empty homes team to deliver an empty homes programme, including the Valleys Task Force, initi Task Force initiative. That's a mouthful. OK, over to Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. The purpose of this report is to seek Cabinet approval to participate in the proposed empty homes work programme and to establish an empty homes team to deliver the required work given Welsh Government's interest in the area. It is recommended to create an empty homes team within the private sector housing department with the associated costs being met through capital earmarked reserves. It is also recommended that we approve the capital funding required to support the delivery of phase two of the empty property grants via the Valley Task Force initiative and the establishment of an empty homes team. Unfortunately, without a dedicated staff resource to deal with issues surrounding empty homes, to date we have only been able to deal with reactive complaints linked to long-term empty properties. Welsh Government are keen to address the problems associated with empty properties and are currently progressing an enforcement agenda throughout Wales, which will hopefully return empty properties, including empty homes, back into use. This report outlined the private sector empty homes work programme linked to the Welsh Government agenda and the development of an empty homes team to undertake the work as well as contributing to wider issues associated with empty properties in the borough. Cabinet are therefore asked to note the content of the report, to approve the creation of an empty homes team and the funding of fixed term staffing costs of £275,000 to deliver the work programme associated with Welsh Government's empty property enforcement agenda. We are asked to approve the capital allocation of up to £700,000 to support the delivery of phase two empty property grants via the Valleys Task Force initiative and agree that the total funding requirement of up to £975,000 should be met from capital earmarked reserves. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. OK, Ross. Uh, thank you, Leader. I would like to um, second the report for the reasons contained within. Um, I think there's a very clear need for you know, housing in this county borough. And it's so frustrating when there are so many. Th there are many reasons for it, but it's, it's so frustrating to see empty homes. And I think the creation of a team and also th this funding will dramatically improve our ability to uh, bring those back into uh, occupation. So I think this is a fantastic report. Thank you. It's OK. Would anyone else like to make any comment? Or... Um, Leonard. Yeah. Oh, I'll bring a Leonard first, then you, Sean. OK. Yeah, uh, just a comment from me. I haven't got a question on the report, but we all know properties throughout the borough which are in need of renovation. Some of these not only look unsightly within our communities, but they attract antisocial behaviour. So I am pleased that this report will address some of these issues that the empty properties bring into our communities. And it's also providing much needed additional housing in the borough. So I am really happy with this again. Thank you. No, thank you for those words, Leonard, Sean. Uh, first of all, could I ask which officer would, would likely speak to this report? Is it Jane Robert Waits so... or? No, it's Claire, Claire Davis. Oh, so, OK, sorry. Yeah, if I could just ask Claire then, I mean, I'm very much in favour of, of, of this report and setting up a, a empty homes team. Um, Claire, you, you, well, you, you know, um, I've had uh, uh, personally, uh, I, I've made representations about derelict properties in my own ward uh, to you in the past. And I know that the, the difficulties, I mean, to me, the setting up of an empty homes team is, is long overdue. And I know it's a role that you've been really doing besides your main day-to-day -day work uh, in the past. Um, there are 
there are far too many, uh, not just empty, but dilapidated uh, properties in such a state of decay that, um, as Elena just said, they impact really on, on the um, ability of their neighbours to enjoy their own environment. I mean, there's so many properties. You, you, if, if you can have one property in the middle of an estate um, and that can be overlooked by perhaps 10 or 20 other properties, you've got an a, 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 empty building, uh, as I say, with antisocial behaviour going on in there or something, if, if nobody cares for or loves these homes, then it does impact on, on other residents. So, Claire, I just wonder how much with this funding and this hem empty homes team, how much do we, how many people, or how many homes do, do, do we seek to um, bring back into in, into uh, suitable use in the community, you know? I mean, this, this is something that's quite urgent and is something that's on the radar of just about every councillor in, in, in the borough. Yeah. Um, hello, um, I'm Claire Davis, Private Sector Housing Manager. Um, yeah, in relation to the empty homes situation, as the report states, we've only had one staff member who's been able to deal with it one day a week. It's only 20% of the time, so our progress has been limited. And most of the um, progress to date is linked to enforcement when problems really get out of hand and you know the local authority is forced to deal with it. And I know we've, we've dealt with some very serious issues up in um, Councillor Stenner's ward at the time in Durban Street. Um, but in relation to proactive initiatives, it's very limited because we haven't got the time at the moment in relation to the staff support to move them on. And we haven't got the funding to enable us to offer that cart on a stick for somebody to come forward and try to get their property back into use. So what we hope to do here through the Valley Task Force um, initiative is to approach the people, the owners of the properties that have previously not been very forthcoming with any work and sort of offer that carrot, if you like, to enable them to take the assistance and then move forward to getting our property occupied again, um, rather than just going forward only when an enforcement situation occurs. Um, in relation to the Valley Task Force, we have been able to take inquiries up to now, obviously for people who are interested in moving forward, and that has been, there's a high demand behind that. I think we've and we got about 138 people, owners of empty properties within the borough, come forward and, you know, just waiting for the, a cabinet decision to see whether they're going to be able to access this. Welsh Government have set a target of 2% of our empty homes figures. Um, that's what they're hoping to deal with through the Valley Task Force Grant Fund. OK. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Claire. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. OK, were there, um, Sean, did you want to come back in? No, no, I was fine. Sorry, I put my hand up. I didn't mean to. You're on mute. You're and, on mute. I, and I constantly do that as well. OK, yeah, it's just catching hands whether they're up or left over. So that's great. Um, okay. Thank you for that. Obviously, this to me is key, isn't it, to improving the landscape as well, you know, in many of our streets, in our villages and towns, because we all, we've all seen those properties that we think, oh, only if they done up and what impact that would make, you know, on the community as well around them. So I think this initiative is really long overdue and I think it's something that we should absolutely invest in and push forward because then being proactive in, in bringing these homes back to life you know, and getting them occupied, which is the target. And, and you know, and I think this is uh, a sensible approach and a, and a great initiative that we should absolutely be supporting. So thanks, Claire, for bringing this report to us today. And thanks, Lisa. OK, um, there's no more further comments. I can't see anyone indicating to come in. So I think we'll go to the roll call and do the vote on that then. OK, Councillor Cuss? Four. Councillor George? Four. Councillor Gordon? Four. Councillor Morgan? Four. Councillor Phipps? Four. Councillor Ridgewell. Four. Councillor Stenner. <coughs> Four. Councillor Whiting. Four. Thank you very much. And that's moved unanimously. So thank you, one and all. Thank you, Claire, for your time. OK, the next item on the agenda is um, Caffili Homes Initiative development proposals. And we've got three uh, areas here, Braven Drive, uh, Intra Thomas, the Crescent, Intra Kenneth, and Oakdale Comprehensive School. If I can move, push, go to Lisa then for this one. Thank you, Lisa. 
Thank you, Leader. Yeah, the purpose of the report today is to inform Cabinet of the work undertaken to date with Wilmot Dixon to increase the number of affordable homes for social rent within Caffili Homes portfolio. The work has fo focused on bringing innovation, scale and momentum to an ambitious desire by the Council to deliver 400 homes by 2025. The report seeks approval from members to formally engage Wilmot Dixon via the SCAPE OJ compliant framework to deliver a new Caffili made bespoke housing solution at the, the Crescent Intra-Kenneth and Llanfabon Drive Intra-Thomas and the former Oakdale Comprehensive School site on behalf of Caffili Homes. The report also seeks approval to apply for funding from the Welsh Government's innovative housing programme for two of the three sites noted above as pilot or demonstrator sites and these are the Crescent Trekenid and Llanfabon Drive Intra-Thomas. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Dobbs um, at Wilmot Dixon, who is going to provide us um, with a presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Phipps. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me OK? Um, thank you for your time. Um, I know you've got a... Andrew, can I yeah. just stop you a second? I just Sorry. need someone to second it and then we'll go into the report Sorry. and then you can absolutely do your bit, which we're waiting for and can't okay. wait. Okay. Um, okay, Colin. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, I'm more than happy to form the uh, second report uh, and the recommendations laid out at three. Okay. Over to you, Andrew. Sorry about that. Okay. That's all right. So apologies. Um, yeah, I know you've got a very busy agenda this morning and um, really do appreciate the time you've afforded us. Um, we are absolutely delighted to have been involved with you uh, since early 2019 when this all started with a conversation I had with, with Christina Harry. Um, and uh, we've, we've made some dramatic progress since that time. So I'm gonna try and share, this is the most nervous part of any presentation of the IT. So let me um, see if I can get this to work. Can you all see that? Okay. Yeah, I can see that, Andrew. Thank see you. That, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so before I get into some of the detail, um, just some positioning uh, sort of facts, really, that you know, 39 percent of all uh, global uh, carbon emissions come from the built environment, and 28 percent of those emissions come from operational carbon, carbon in use. So every construction project that we now do represents an opportunity to not only deal with uh, homelessness, exclusion, uh, fuel poverty, but also it gives affords us the opportunity to deal and fight climate change. And every time we build something and we miss that opportunity, we, we continue to contribute to that problem. Fuel poverty um, in, in Wales has, has improved dramatically, actually, but we are at a, a very uh, dangerous point given the, the current situation with COVID, progress could stall, we could even go backwards. So I think it's really important that, you know, fuel poverty uh, is, is, is continued to be pressed very hard along with the homelessness and the need for ha good quality housing stock. Um, with me this morning um, are, are two colleagues, um, uh, Gemma Welsher, who um, uh, sits with me on the, on the local board, um, and Jamie Duggan. Um, they, they're here to answer any any potential questions I can't I can't deal with. So, um, and they represent. If if you approve uh, this today, they will be responsible for taking this through to the to the, uh, through to the next stage. Uh, when I spoke with Christina back in early 2019, um, it, you know we we were at the start of this. Uh, 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 emerging perfect storm building. You know, we, we obviously had climate change, public awareness around climate change is in, increasing dramatically. From an, in, from an industry point of view, uh, construction has been facing a skill shortage for, for decades and that is increasing by the day. Our ability to deliver in the way that we are currently delivering is, 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 is increasingly compromised. Um, there's obviously the issue we just talked about, about fuel poverty, homelessness, uh, homelessness and exclusion. And then the, 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 the desperately sad circumstances uh, of Grenfell 
and the outfall of post grandfill and dealing with that in any um, any construction that we now do the issue of creating robust um, non-combustible construction is is at the forefront of uh, of the industry um, but if you're an occupier it also can be a very very nervous um, a nervous thing to move into a building that you have concerns about whether uh, whether it's uh, basically safe so the first the first thing that um, we needed to establish was uh, an operating operating environment in which we could start to explore these things and the two key things firstly we introduced yourself to the scape framework escape is a is a essentially a public sector organization formed from a number of local authorities uh, they their governance structure is is the same as as any local authority so they understand all about procurement within within the public sector um, it's an oju compliance or european procurement compliant framework uh, and you were able to access all the services and the governance structure that scape affords you as a public sector organization and that gave you access to us immediately um, and that was that was key in terms of setting the right environment within which we could start talking uh, collaboratively uh, secondly you gave us uh, probably the most ambitious brief i think we've ever been given by anybody um, and i've tried to just capture some of those things on a, on a simple wordle um, at the heart of it was the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act, but lots of the things you've talked about already this morning, about net zero carbon, future ready, uh, Welsh supply chain partners, um, MM, modern methods of construction, manufacturing, field poverty, um, scale, scalability, etc. Cetera, et cetera. You know, these are, uh, it was a, a wide and ambitious brief and remains so to this, to this day. Um, Alongside this, what we were doing as an organisation is, is, is recognising the need for change in construction as well. And we were moving to start to think about construction as a uh, as, as, as manufacturing. The de-skilling that we've experienced uh, is, is not getting replaced and the demand in, in the construction sector is increasing. And even if those skills were replaced, we couldn't deal with the volumes, we could, the scalability of the way we currently do business was not going to meet demand, particularly in housing. Um, so the the idea behind what we're proposing is, is to move uh, move us on considerably and start thinking about housing as as manufacturing, um, and to start thinking of it as a, as a kit of parts. Um, at the core to this discussion was a, a local. Um, a local supply chain partner in in Caerphilly and Hengoid in the uh, Penalta Industrial Estate, a, a Caladan, and Caladan have a great story. They've been supported as a startup by Welsh government, um, and they will be at the heart of this housing system because they will be the the manufacturer of of the, the panels the panels themselves. Uh, they're steel, which um, may sound a, a little odd for a, a low carbon. Uh, construction, but uh, I'll explain why we've gone steel uh, as we go through the, this presentation. Um, and they, uh, what this does offer us is complete flexibility to respond to any site condition. A uh, the volumetric or the sort of the, the the complete buildings cabins, if you like, that are sectionalised and brought on the back of a lorry, um, are very difficult to meet the demands of sites in Wales because of the because of the topography and um, they create a lot of inflexibility and we've had situations where um, you know you can't get you can't get lorries under low bridges for example so our approach is to think of it uh, a bit like IKEA thinks of it or Lego thinks of it think of it a component parts that are replicable that can be manufactured in Wales and actually become in a wider context, become the seed for 21st century manufacturing in Wales as well. Um, you know, we already had dis cons um, discussions with Caledon about future investment, and if we're able to put and, and scale this up, and they they will invest, uh, and they will scale up, and they will create more employment, and that economic multiplier effect, the potential for that is 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 absolutely huge. So, it's a, a very very exciting partner to have. At the midst of of, of this uh, of this project, uh, similarly we we're using um, uh, FP Hurley, who are based in Ueni, 
and another Welsh another Welsh partner to, to do the electrical and plumbing works. So two two key partners uh, within the core of the, the current uh, design proposal. But there will be others as we move into the next stage and start fleshing out the design. Um, these these properties are all about quality and economy. And um, uh, you've mentioned passive house this morning. These will be passive house. Um, and the, the, there is a, a, a sort of a first really here in that what we're doing is is taking passive house as a concept and turning it and applying manufacturing concepts to it and turning it into a kit which we can a, a, a respond to any site condition and the reason passive house is so important is i'm not sure if you can read those numbers on the side there but the average uk home uh, has a, a fuel bill of about 1400 pounds a year um a passive house is about 70 pounds a year um changing the currency to carbon is really important here as well because that that 1400 pounds translates to 10 tons of carbon per house per year whereas a passive house is 0.5 of a ton. To keep global temperature rises below two degrees, uh, we need to be limiting carbon emissions per person to between two to three metric tons. Uh, so if we carried on building poor quality housing stock that we, we are currently out there doing now, we just can, we're just continually contributing to the problem. Passive house gives us that headroom and every passive house we build starts starts rolling back that that pressure on carbon uh, and these are these are really fit for climate properties they're the highest build quality standard that we can currently achieve and i think it says something about your ambition as well and and uh and your leadership in this area to, to say to the most vulnerable and most disadvantaged in society you're going to put them in the highest quality homes that we can actually currently provide in terms of wider objectives, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, as I said, is at the heart of this. And within the IHP funding, uh, which uh, we will be submitting, hopefully submitting as part of this proposal, um, is an assessment um, of how construction can support um, the, uh, the, the seven key themes of IHP. Um, and what I've done here is just shown how this proposal pretty much ticks off everything that they've produced. The crosses on there um, are relating to things which don't really apply to passive house, for example, like breathable construction, um, and whether these are changeable by the community. They, you know, these are high quality, highly engineered homes. Um, major structural, major structural changes wouldn't be um, uh, changeable by the community, but you know they could be they could be changed and adapted uh, in the future by competent uh, competent construction professionals but we're hitting pretty much everything within within the wellbeing future generations act again which is which is which is incredible really just to touch back on that reason for steel over timber um you know, the, well, the the biggest thing that we have to deal with predominantly in the uk at the moment and particularly in wales um, from climate change is flooding um, and the the use of timber is not a particularly resilient material to repeated flood conditions um, it doesn't recover well so one of the key aspects for cho choosing steel over timber was uh, uh, flood resilience the other one uh, is is obviously fire so the, the this this design for these Kafili homes will have completely non-combustible envelopes we've designed them uh, to remove uh, the combustible insulation. Um, there will be no combustibles in that envelope uh, outside of outside of windows, which obviously there's, you know, we, we, we can't do anything about, but those are not the main materials uh, that are, uh, are sort of looked at in terms of combustibility on, on an envelope. So there'll be no fuel load in the main elements of those, those buildings, which along with the requirements in Wales for, for sprinklers, again provides an incredibly safe um, environment whether it's that single story or multiple stories um, the palette of materials that we're looking at again we're using modern materials that are highly you know, uh, high content and manufacturing um, these will form 
contemporary facade options for us, uh, giving us a good colour palette, um, but they will not seek to produce, you know, wildly exotic built environments. They will look different, but they won't feel completely out of context. They will have context to the their place setting, but they will have a nod to the future, and they will they will show to the public that actually we're trying to move the the agenda on, and they will they will stand out as as as, as beacons of what future housing and the quality of future housing should look like. So we've got again these are all non-combustible materials, but we've got things like Marley cedar, which is a cementitious timber effect, um, vertical tile slate. Um, options uh, which give more texture and uh, almost brick-like effects. Uh, we haven't gone for brick because only because of a, a cost, prohibit, uh, cost prohibitive uh, position at the moment. Brick slip systems are uh, just hugely expensive. But over time, as, as as this is scaled up, we expect those to to come down. So those are our starting uh, our starting options. Um, the two sites mentioned, um, to Thomas, um, and, and again, interesting to, to hear previous comments about regeneration, how to how to lift um, expectations and aspirations within poor spaces. This is a, a, a fairly uh, bland and uh, potentially uh, socially dangerous site, I suppose, at times. If, if in, in the evenings, that it it could pose could pose uh, some difficulties. Um, a just big empty island space. Um, we've done a few just quick artist impressions about how we could lift that space with this product. And as you can see, these these houses will look like normal houses, but they'll just material palette wise, they will just stretch um, uh, the context away from some of the more traditional building materials. Uh, similarly, Tree Kenneth, um, another uh, Another uh, another sort of infill site. Um, we can complete that street scene um, in keeping, but just again pushing the the the, the envelope to say uh, these are uh, these are contextually similar but but different. In terms of in terms of costs, um, the uh, the overall the overall development cost feasibility wise we've we've provided you at the moment is is just over 20 million for the three sites. Um, but there's a potential capital receipt uh, with the sale of the, the private for sale units on Oakdale of circa 12. And to Thomas and to Kenneth, if it's successful with the IHP funding, will be substantially supported um, by uh, by that fund as well. And the, the, the intervention rates, I think, depending on um, uh, the how how they look at the development it varies between 58 to 58 percent to 100 percent so there's substantial further recovery uh, which will reduce the, the the capital outlay um and that will provide um 100 and 120 um effectively low energy passive house homes within the borough um because of the nature of these these will be tenure blind which i think is an, another really important thing we we are not we're not here as a developer. We're not here to um, try and take development yield out of the out of the the deal here. This is about supporting you to develop communities. Um, so we have no interest in segregating the social elements uh, from the private for sale. These properties will be of the same standard, same quality, um, and you, you will you know you will have the opportunity to produce a completely integrated uh, development. Which I think is, uh, is is also very important. Timescale wise, um, IHP is driving some of these timescales, particularly Trickana and Thomas. Um, and following following this later in September, we've we've got submissions and presentations to do to 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 the Design Commission for Wales. Um, and the requirements of the funding will mean that if you are successful. We'll need to start on site on those two by April 2021. So the pressure is on to seek approval for for those two sites, uh, particularly. Um, the plan would be to hopefully follow in mean, pre-construction with Oakdale and to because that's a, there's there's more work to do to understand the development mix there and and that, that housing sale and what the market wants. And so there's 
Um, the construction period for that um, is yet to be established, but it, it would follow uh, follow on or in tandem with uh, Tree Kenneth and Tree Thomas. Um, finally, I just want to say that uh, you know we 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 just have one planet, um, and I think Wales has led the world. The Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is is a an incredible piece of legislation that recognised by the United Nations. Um, and I think what you're doing, the reason I'm here today, along with my colleagues, is, is as a result of your ambition, your drive and your leadership to, to do something different. Um, and you could easily replace uh, Wales with Caerphilly there, because I think there's nobody else seeking to tick off as many boxes as you are. There's plenty of people out there building trying to build low carbon, low energy homes, but not in a way you're looking at it. Your ambition was much wider. You started with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and that that connective tissue of all those seven key themes is very much at the heart of this proposal. Um, and the fact that we are also engaging with local partners and looking to start to re-industrialise Wales in a modern sense uh, and to, to create manufacturing in Wales that could not only support uh, manufacturer, manufacturing of homes in Wales, but actually beyond the borders and even even into Europe, potentially, um, I think is, is, a, is a very exciting proposition. So um, I hope we can continue this journey with you. It's been an incredibly exciting uh, 12 months or so for us as, as an organisation. And, uh, you know, we hope to continue that journey at you journey with you tackling fuel poverty, homelessness and climate change one home at a time. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if you if you have any um, and uh, just conscious of time myself. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Andrew, for that detailed, that detailed uh, presentation. presentation. Um, um, just bring Lisa in then just to reiterate the recommendations and then we'll go to some questions. Thank you, Lisa. But before before I do that, can I take the opportunity to thank Wilmot Dixon for being with us today and really for all their hard work to date and um, for being as, as as ambitious as us, really, and delivering for us. Um, I, I'm really grateful and, and thank you for coming today. Um, but I also want to thank Jane roberts White, who's on this call somewhere, because she's worked tirelessly to deliver this, uh, to bring this report to us today. So a big thank you to, to Jane as well. But if I can just run through the recommendations to Cabinet today, and that is for Cabinet to approve the move to the pre-construction phase of the SCAPE framework for the Crescent Trekenev, Llanfavon Drive to Thomas, and the former Oakdale School site at a cost of £814,000. To, for Cabinet to approve the move from the pre-construction phase for the SCAPE framework through to full planning and into the development phase for the Crescent Trekenev and Llanvaban Drive to Thomas sites at an estimated cost of £3.7 million. And for Cabinet to approve the submission of an IHP funding proposal to finance up to 58% of the costs associated with the pre-construction and development of the Trekenev and Thomas sites and up to 100% of the innovation related costs. But could I also ask Cabinet to look at point 14.1, um, this, given the time scales that Andrew alluded to, um, it's important that this report has come to us today um, because of the tight de deadline of the 25th of, of September. So I'd ask you to note, to note the, the time scales, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa, for pointing out. Absolutely. And, you know, that is vital that we're aware. Of, so thank you for drawing that to our attention. Um, I, I mean, just on the back um, of what you just talked about there, Andrew, in terms of the fall in manufacturing, I mean, manufacturing is an area in, this UK, in the UK is going to suffer greatly over the next six to 12 months. We know with the caps of the aviation industry and possibly the car industry, we all know that manufacturing skill jobs are going to be um, lost um, so for me, this is actually ties in, doesn't it, with that, you know, upskilling and the manufacturing element that we can actually push. As you say, modern, modern methods of construction are quite different to the normal construction methods that we've traditionally known. So to be innovative 
stretch forward and doing this I think is it's absolutely fantastic and you know I'm I'm all for being you know bold and brilliant in this area I think we absolutely need to lead the way you know and it It'd be good to be the first in something there isn't so horrific as having to have a local lockdown. You know, it would be great to be a first in this this area of construction and actually lead the way. So um, I think it's important from that manufacturing element and that locality and, and, and bringing on skills and developing things locally. I think that is absolutely commendable. So thank you. Right, I've got many indications now to come in. So I'll bring in Sean and then John. Yeah, um, thank you, Lida, and uh, thank you, Andrew, for for the um, concise and um, very exciting, I would say, uh, presentation. Uh, it, it certainly, um, I, I'm going to speak from from my position again as the Wellbeing Future Generations Champion for for the um, for the council. Uh, what the world is doing to uh, what, what Wales is doing today, the world will be doing tomorrow. Absolutely right. This is the only way to go. Well-being, the future generations champ, uh, uh, legislation, you know, looking to, at generations going forward and making sure all decisions are made for f future generations is is the only way the world can move. It's it's not a point of uh, uh, there are choices. It is the only way that we can move. Um, coming down to this specifically, 400 uh, new social homes, low carbon, low running costs mechanical ventilation and heat recovery systems, life, the lifetime, considering the lifetime carbon use of, of the building and not, not just, I mean, the, the whole thing ticks all, all the boxes in the right place or, you know, massively in favour of this. And I'm sure that um, work like this is going to shift the goalposts of those um, uh, private developers out there and it's going to set the bar for private developers when you talk about the running costs of uh, a property under normal circumstances and one under passive house I mean the, the, this is going to be reflected in obviously the um, ultimately the sale price of those properties because, yeah. because again you're talking about the, 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 the lifetime costs of a, of a property so all in all fantastic I think I got a quick question for Jane uh, Jane Robert Sweet regarding the innovative housing program, and and if you could just talk a little bit more about the fact that we will likely to get 58% um, of the cost of progress in the, the these two sites. Could could you elaborate on that, Jane? Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, Jane Roberts Waite, Strategic Coordination Manager and, and partly responsible for the report. Um, thank you, Councillor Morgan. Yes, the IHP uh, programme is in its fourth year now. It's a programme that's been uh, running for, for some time and, and various innovative proposals have come forward and been funded. Obviously, we haven't been as a council in the position to be able to apply for that monies. Uh, those monies previously. Um, however, because we're at the outset of our development program, we very much are in a position now to apply for the funding that's been released. Um, it is a competitive process. It's a very complex process as well. Um, and it was only announced, I think, at the back end of July, around about the 25th. Um, so it came as a bit of a surprise and we have had to mobilise very quickly um, in order to, to meet the requirements. The, the requirements of the programme itself um, include a meeting with the Design Commission for Wales and the purpose of that meeting is so that they and their experts can really have a dialogue with the people seeking funding on the proposed schemes um, and also act as a critical friend, um, so providing um, advice support, suggestions, possible amendments um, to the scheme so that, it, as I say, they act as a critical friend in all, and, and we really see that as a good opportunity to enhance our proposals. So we have to go through that process first. We've um, got one indicatively booked with the Design Commission for Wales on the 16th of September um, and we expect to receive a report back from them uh, five working days later. We then need to submit our proposal to Welsh Government for consideration on the 25th of September. So you can appreciate the timescales are incredibly tight. Um, we had a meeting with Darren Hatton this week from Welsh Government to understand more about how the costs can be split. You mentioned the 58% cost um, and then the 100% um, innovation cost. And I think we're quite clear now in terms of perhaps 
the steel frame panelized system that Andrew has referred to, you know, that is the innovation within this, this proposal, the kit of parts. And so we would be, certainly be hoping to obtain 100% of the costs from the innovation program for that. Um, things such as surveys and investigations, et cetera, they would be 58% um, funded. So we're just working through that process at the moment, but this is a super opportunity really for the council to take advantage now of this program, which is in its final year, um, and to really demonstrate our ambition, our vision, and what we can do. Thanks for that, uh, Jane. Most appreciated. Uh, John. Yeah, thanks, Leader. Um, uh, Andrew, this is... A, a, excuse me, I have a little dog. I'll just pause in a minute. I think we have somebody at the door. Bear with me. Naughty Bertie. I just wrestle with him over that. That's young Bertie. <laughs> Do apologise for that. Yeah, hugely exciting, I think, this, uh, this is. Uh, and your presentation was absolutely brilliant. Um, one of the things I find about this, and particularly I was a, as a former chair of, of our, our housing scrutiny uh, committee, is the opportunity this offers. And um, I wonder if that there's, a, there's a chance here for really looking at something in terms of the design, which takes us to a, to a step change. Um, if you Google in um, a Passive House, there are some amazing buildings there. Mm. Uh, and, and I have this wonderful dream that, in, that when we have... Um, social housing in the future. It isn't one of these little boxes that people live in, but it's something that really stimulates people's imagination and um, and desire to want to live in them, rather than being something that, oh, it's a, it's a council house. Um, it seems like a golden opportunity. Um, I know we're all this together, but it's a plea for um, uh, for breaking the mold on this and, and perhaps taking that boldness another a, a step further. That's all I wanted to say, thanks. I'll, I'll, Bertie will finish it for me, thank you. <laughs> Good timing, Bertie, yep. Um, no, thanks, John. You know, and I think it's really important. This signals the future, doesn't it? You know, and the way we want to proceed. Um, you know, this to me is is so exciting. And as you say, this is sensitive, and we need to move, and we need to take action. Um, I, I I'm not seeing any other indications to come in. I just want to say, yeah, and I will put my thanks on record for both Jane and the team, and also Andrew and your team as well, because this, you know, without these conversations, without that us wanting to be ambitious in the future, our housing stock then you know you know these this this sort of um, collaboration work would not have happened so i'm grateful that those conversations started and i think you know this is going to take us on to bigger and better things as well and i just think this holistically is going to be the way forward and we need to absolutely embrace this and go forward so um as i said i'm not seeing any other indicators to come in so i think we're going to go straight to the vote on this and improve uh, and uh, taking forward those recommendations okay councillor cuss Four. Councillor George. Four. Councillor Gordon. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Phipps. Four. Councillor Ridgewell. Four. Councillor Stenner. Four. And Councillor Whiting. Four. Thank you all. Um, absolutely fantastic work, and you know, and I'm looking forward to being successful in those bids that we we're going to submit so um let's keep in contact and make sure that we, we move this forward so thank you very much andrew and the team no thank you very much and look forward to uh, continuing the journey with you okay deal. okay Thanks. all right okay yeah, fantastic and i can see why you were so excited now lisa so um no fun it's great news so okay that's the end of our uh, agenda today and i just want to take the opportunity to thank you and i think for me in kind of summing up this I think it indicates quite clearly that these last three reports in terms of eight, nine and ten, they signal what our manifesto was all about. And that was providing council housing of, of or affordable housing. So this to me is a fantastic opportunity for us to fulfill that manifesto pledge and move forward. And I think that is so evident in, in the depth of the reports and, and also the different opportunities that they give us so I want to say thank you again and this is also very much along our our mantra about you know social uh, heart commercial head so I really thank you all in terms of this and uh, again this sums up our manifesto commitments in a nutshell so thank you very much everyone okay if the cabinet can just stay on as well please thank you and uh, Charlotte can stop filming thank you Thanks.